Hello, everybody. It's Friday. It is time for Friday Live. I want to welcome you here today. I am so excited to be here today sharing with you about the writing process. So this is something that most parents have questions about and pretty much every student is struggling with in some way or another. So today I want to demystify all of that for you and give you a step by step for how you can teach your student the writing process. This is an important step to being able to do well academically and also in life because the skills that we learn through the writing process are the same skills that we need to succeed in every area of life. So I wanna thank you for coming today. Please pop down in the comments and let me know if you are here on a live or a replay. I'd love to know who showed up. And I want to know today, can you just tell me what's the age of your student? So just pop in the comments and tell me their age. You don't have to give your name or anything like that, but I just want to uh, know kind of what age I am looking at. So today we're going to be talking about the writing process. We're going to talk about it's the same process, whether it's for a paragraph or whether it's for an essay. So many of you will understand that a paragraph has introduction, the body and the conclusion and an essay has exactly the same thing. Now, in a paragraph, we have introductory sentences, body sentences, and conclusion sentences. And in an essay, we have an introductory paragraph, body paragraphs, and a, and a conclusion paragraph. So they're exactly the same structure, whether they're a paragraph or whether they're an essay. It's just that the components are built out of different things. They're either built out of sentences or they're built out of paragraphs. So today we're going to talk a little bit more about how we can get your student writing through the writing process and learning these skills. So first of all, for all you critical thinkers out there, what does she know anyway? And this is a great question. I'm so glad that you're asking this question. I love critical thinkers. If you are not asking this question, you should be. You should be asking this question of anyone who is teaching your student Anyone who is giving you information, you need to know who are they, what do they believe, how did they get there, why should I even be listening to them? So today I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I am Teresa. I am the language arts mentor with Discern to Learn, and I am a mentor at heart. I want to help students. I come alongside them. I help them to dream big, and I help them to get to their goals using the writing process. So that seems like a very, very big thing to say, a big claim, but I've had amazing success doing this. I have helped so many students be able to be more self-motivated and more self-disciplined, more organized in their lives, and they learn that all through essays. So, but even then, don't take my word for it. You should be wondering what other people are saying. So on my website, you'll be able to go and you'll be able to click to this website and read all of my reviews, but I've got a couple here for you right now. I've had amazing results with students being able to come into my classroom and they begin with trepidation and fear. They begin with anxiety, um, like traditional anxiety symptoms, heart palpitations, sweaty hands, headaches, nausea, all of those things that we would think come with an anxiety disorder. And that doesn't mean they have an anxiety disorder. It does not mean they have dysgraphia. It doesn't mean anything like that. It means that they're struggling with their own emotions and they don't know how to handle it. That's not to say that at some point, if it's an ongoing thing, that you might not want to investigate those things. But I've seen amazing results with students who come in and they overcome that and they learn that they can learn to write. And when they learn they can learn to write, everything changes because they learn that they can make a difference in their own success. And it gives them unbelievable confidence to set higher goals and reach higher dreams. So today, if you want to read all of these reviews and more, you can go to discerntolearn.com and right on the homepage, you're going to see a link where you can go and read all my reviews. And there's a lot of video reviews there as well. The writing process. Okay, so this is just a bird's eye view of the writing process. The first thing students have to do is brainstorm and come up with creative ideas, creative topics, and then conduct the research. And yes, research. You cannot just write about whatever. You have to be able to prove your point. 
So I personally don't waste my time with just emotional responses. How did this make you feel? Um, that's great if your goal is to learn to deal with emotions and to express emotion in academics and in life, the skills that we need are persuasive skills. So that's not to say that it's not important to deal with our emotions. I absolutely talk about emotions all of the time with my students. They probably get tired of me asking them, and how does that make you feel? We talk about those things, but when it comes to writing paragraphs and essays that are done with excellence, they need to prove something. So they do need to research, and we're gonna talk more about that. They need to create a logical outline, then they write a first draft, then they edit, get feedback, edit again, then they edit it again and again, and eventually they submit their um, essay or their paragraph. So that's just the overview of where we're going today and how we're going to process this entire um, writing process. As we're going, I would like you to think about how much of this is actually writing. And we're gonna get to that a little bit later as well. So first of all, we have the pre-writing stage. And in the pre-writing stage, students um, either find a topic, which is often very stressful because um, finding your own topic means you have to pick something that's not too hard because you don't want to fail at it, but it can't be too easy because then you're just gonna be called out for picking a bad topic. So it's very difficult for students often to choose their own topic. Um, Alternately, they may choose from a list of topics that are given to them, but either way, they have to choose a topic. And then once they have that topic, they need to narrow down that idea. So for instance, let's today just talk about one of my favorite topics um, that I use as an example in many of my classes, and it's mosquitoes. So the mosquitoes are the topic. This is the big picture thing that we're talking about. But this is not just a report, everything you want to know about mosquitoes. This is not where mosquitoes live and how they breed and what they need and all of that. That is a research report. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a persuasive piece of writing. And just FYI, research reports like that, that are just regurgitation that textbooks ask you to do all of the time, they are the really should be one of the later skills that we learn because what we need to do is we need our research reports to still prove something. They should still prove something. They should not just be an about because unless you're writing for an encyclopedia, about is not very helpful. In our lives, the skills that we need are all about persuasion. And so our writing should focus mostly on persuasive writing. So we take that idea of mosquitoes and then we narrow it down. Well, what can I prove? And students right away say, oh, mosquitoes are, mosquitoes are bad. Bad, what does bad mean? What does good mean? We have to take those words and replace them. We can't say that something is bad or something is good. Those are moral words. They don't tell us really anything about mosquitoes. So we need to say that mosquitoes are harmful, mosquitoes are helpful. Um, we're not gonna say mosquitoes are a pest because how are you gonna prove that? Well, they irritate me. Well, that's not very provable. So we need to have something that we can actually prove in a better way than just, I don't like, my opinion about. So we need to have something that we can prove that is more than just how it makes me feel or I don't like something, or this is my favorite. The other thing, be very careful with in students right at the beginning, they all wanna say this compared to this. So they wanna say dogs are better than cats. Um, comparing two things is actually an advanced essay or an advanced paragraph. This is not something you want to start with. So right away, try to knock those off the list as well. So we might say, Mosquitoes are harmful or mosquitoes are helpful. Which side should I prove today? I could prove either actually, because there's plenty of research that proves both sides. So I'm going to prove that mosquitoes are harmful, okay? And so now I have that idea, that's what I want to prove. 
And ideally, we've done a little bit of research here to find out more information. Students right away, they don't know all the facts. They don't know all the things they need. And so doing like five or 10 minutes of research in this pre-writing to just find out, is this a logical thing that I can prove? What does the other side say? Always check the other side. So if you wanna say mosquitoes are terrible and we should kill them all, then you should be searching why we should not eradicate mosquitoes. Find out what other people say. Find out what the proofs are on the other side. See if your argument actually is any good before you try to prove it. So it's really, really important and students wanna skip this step. They wanna skip the find out what the other side thinks because we all just want everyone to think the same as us. And we don't want to identify that the opposite side of the argument might have reasonable proofs. And it's really important for us to know what those are. So then we brainstorm. So we write down everything we already know. We write down everything we still need to know and maybe a little bit more research there. And this isn't even the real research. This is just, just making sure I'm going down the right track kind of research. So this is all pre-writing. This is like, you, you haven't even started yet. You're just like picking a topic and getting ready to go. So this brainstorming step is something that students want to skip. They think it is a waste of time. Trust me, it's not a waste of time. I never ever ask my students to do busy work and every single step of the way is really important. I promise them this regularly that if I ask them to do something, it really matters. The next thing in pre-writing is research notes and organization. So this is where they start to do their real research. And when they do this research, it's really important that they understand how to know what a good source is. So good sources, one of the things, a few of the things that we will recognize a good source by is they're not trying to sell you something. If you go to a website and you try to, you know, look for information about getting rid of mosquitoes and they're trying to sell you a pesticide or a, a bug lamp or any one of those things, that, that's a bad source. They're trying to sell you something. They would tell you anything to get your money. And that's, or potentially, they would tell you anything to get your money. So those are not good sources. They're gonna choose the facts and cherry pick them for their own argument. And we wanna make sure we're not cherry picking our facts for our argument. We wanna make sure that it's actually fact-based. So first of all, they're not selling you anything. Second of all, if they say a study shows they should be telling you what that study is and where it is. So you can go and check that study, even if you can't understand it. You should be able to click on it and you should be able to see what the study is. So they should have sources. Uh, Wikipedia is long-term now not been seen as a quality source. They are trying to fix this. So generally speaking, I would recommend never to put Wikipedia as one of your sources. However, if you go to Wikipedia and they have links to studies and they have links to other places with information, what a great resource to go and find those other links and then use the other links as your sources. Don't use Wikipedia as a source because generally in the academic community, it's considered like a bad source, but it is a good place to go for all the information you need. It's sort of like if you want bread to go to a bakery, so they just give you a quick overview of the entire topic. Wikipedia is a great place actually in like our earlier pre-writing to get some information on both sides. Note-taking. In this step of the process, note-taking is so, so important. This is where students want to um, shorten the task and they copy paste copious amounts of information and they stick it in a document and that just means they're wasting their time later. It's super important that they paraphrase at this point in their process because later they're gonna get into the harder things. This is the easy part. Just put it in your own words. And paraphrasing does not mean taking a sentence that you really like and changing up a couple of words. Paraphrasing means to read something, to understand it, go and find the definitions of the words that you don't understand so you understand what they're saying and then to be able to take that idea 
and put that idea out in your own way. That's what paraphrasing is. It should be point form. It should be short and it should just be like a short thing. The other big problem that really trips students up at this point in the pre-writing is their ideas and their reasons and their facts and their sources and there's all these details and they just don't know how to organize them. So this is something that I teach them how to do and I'm gonna show you how I teach that today. So um, it's really important that when you're taking notes, you never, ever take down a fact without taking down its source. Anytime you find a URL or a book title that has a fact that you might use, right away you want to put that in your sources table. So that's this first table at the top here and I hope you can see my mouse on it. It says source code and URL book title. So in the column that says URL or book title, you're going to paste the link to where you found it. It's probably going to be on the internet. So that would be the link where you found that, that fact or that information. And if it's a book title, put the book title, whatever. And then we just label it with a code. So A, B, C, I don't recommend numbers because numbers kind of get blended in with other facts. But A, B, C, I have one student that likes to label them differently. However you want to label them, just make sure that they are clear so that you know what you're doing. Then, so we have mosquitoes. So I might find a website about um, the risks that mosquitoes pose. So I might say my facts that prove my first reason. My first reason would be that uh, mosquitoes are dangerous. So mosquitoes are dangerous. And so then my first fact might be this many people die every year from malaria which is contracted only through mosquitoes. And at source A, it would be the source that is up on the table. Then I would continue and every single fact that I find at that first URL is gonna have a source A code beside it. And this is when I start organizing. Now, some students aren't ready to organize yet. So then they might just have a table with a whole bunch of facts and a whole bunch of source codes and then after they can rearrange them into reasons and ideas. And I'll show you what the reasons and ideas are when we get to the outline piece. So often though, they know, um, why do I believe this? Okay, I believe that mosquitoes are harmful because they kill lots of people every year and because they are the deadliest animal in the world. And so then I might also need in this paragraph or in this essay to say, although they are the most deadly animal in the world. Um, sorry, I was proving that they were helpful. I don't remember what I was proving. Um, although they're the most deadly animal in the world, we don't want to eradicate them because they're needed for pollination. They're needed for this. They're needed for this. They're needed for this. Okay. So we need to keep mosquitoes despite the fact that they are the deadliest creature in the world. And we can reduce the risks by doing this, this, and this. And that would be in my conclusion, how we reduce the risks. So that's kind of how we would like lay out our outline and think about our reasons. <clears throat> okay, we're still in pre-writing and we haven't even started yet, okay. So the next thing we have to do is we have to outline. So that's a little bit more about that. Um, an outline is gonna show persuasive proofs. So we're gonna know exactly what we're proving. I am proving that mosquitoes need to be in the world even though they're dangerous, okay? Now having the even though is a second level type of writing because now I have a rebuttal that I'm coming again, that I'm, that I'm arguing against. So that's a second level. So your first level of writing would not have a rebuttal. So after they figure out how to prove something, then they can prove something with a rebuttal. So an initial outline might be, uh, pizza can be part of a healthy diet. And my reasons are a healthy diet includes, or my thesis would be, pizza can be part of a healthy diet because a healthy meal includes all of the food groups. And so 
then my reason number one would be it includes carbohydrates. My reason number two would be it includes proteins. And my reason number three is it includes fruits or vegetables. And in order to boost that, we could also have it with a side salad and that would make it perfectly healthy. Healthy. Okay. And so if that, if I'm defining healthy as having all the food groups, then that would work. Absolutely. That would be how we would have an initial outline for a first level student. As they get a little bit farther, then they may have a rebuttal. So they might say pizza is a healthy meal because it has all the food groups. However, it also is high in salt, high in nitrates, and those are a problem for people who have cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure. Um, so then you would be bringing in just like the second side of that. So if you have those things, then you might need to be careful or you might have to make accommodations in your type of pizza. So that would be a second level. So that's kind of like how we can like grow from one step to the next step through the writing. So it's gonna have to have proof. So we have to have a reason. So let's go back to my pizza example. And I would say there are carbohydrates in pizza. A pizza crust is made from flour. And even if it's gluten-free, it would be made from a gluten-free grain. So rice or uh, chickpea or um, almond or cauliflower. So we could have, actually cauliflower is not a carb. Um, so we could have like the crust made out of alternate grains. And so we could say that that's an important part of healthy diet, having carbohydrates in meals. And then the next paragraph would say it has protein. And we would talk about protein in cheese and protein in meat. And then the next paragraph would be about fruits and vegetables. Although uh, many pizzas don't have a lot of fruits and vegetables on them, there's no reason we can't put onions, mushrooms, peppers, tomatoes, um, olives, you know, just start listing all the possible toppings that we could add to a pizza that are vegetables or pineapple, if you're okay with having some fruit on there. And we could put a side salad and that would make it even more vegetables because we're supposed to have more vegetables than other things. So we would want this to come. So we have a reason and then we have our proofs and we have a reason and then we have our proofs. And then we also need a logical point order. So when they're making their outline, they may rearrange the points. So not so much in the pizza one, but in, in other topics, it may be really important in the logic to guide the reader step-by-step step through the process so that they're not shocked by something. We wanna guide our reader through our point order so that they are most likely to be able to agree with us by the end of our piece of writing. So that's one of the ways that we can help in our outlining process. This is what an outline might look like. So initially we would have the hook or ideas for a hook. So they don't have to write sentences here. This is just for my hook to, to get my reader interested. I might consider this or this or this. And then I'm going to put my thesis here. So what I'm trying to prove, my first reason. So for instance, um, if I were doing mosquitoes, I would say my hook idea might be talk about how mosquitoes at a picnic are a bother um, or around a campfire. And then my thesis would be mosquitoes are such a bother, but really, even though they pose major risks, they are definitely important in this world. And then my first reason, I would prove why they're important in this world. And I would say they're pollinators. I would say that would be my first reason. So then I would give examples of facts that prove that they're pollinators. So these facts would be in this table and they would have the source code on the side. So whatever website told me which types of plants uh, mosquitoes pollinate, um, would go there. This would also be where we talk about which mosquitoes pollinate. Only male mosquitoes pollinate. They don't suck anybody's blood and the majority of mosquitoes are actually male. That would all come in reason one. 
Then reason two would be, not only are they pollinators, but mosquitoes are really important in the food chain because they feed other creatures. And so then I would talk about what would happen if there were no mosquitoes in the world? What would dragonflies eat? What would you know birds eat? How would it change our ecosystem if we didn't have mosquitoes? And I would have each one of those facts and every single fact that I have would have to have a proof beside it, like ABC, right? Or something like that, one of the URL codes. So we would go through that way and continue through our reasons. And then in the conclusion, they don't actually have to write conclusion now. If they're doing um, an essay, they might wanna consider how they are going to tie it all up. And maybe they might want to tie it all up by saying, even though we know that mosquitoes um, kill more people in the world than any other animal with us, this number of people dying every year from malaria and other mosquito-borne illnesses, um, it's still really important that mosquitoes are kept in our ecosystem because it's important for our food chain. And there are ways that we can mitigate the risks of mosquitoes, and those would be this, this, and this. So that would be their conclusion. So just ideas of things they want to put in their conclusion if they're writing an essay. But if they're writing a paragraph, they don't even have to write anything there. It's just That's just to make sure that they write conclusion sentences. At this point, I want to remind you parents, by the time you get to middle school, um, a paragraph is not five sentences. So a paragraph in like grade two, three, four um, is one introductory sentence, one sentence for each reason, and one sentence conclusion. That is like the gold standard for a paragraph in early, early elementary school. By middle school, that's not the case anymore. So your introduction sentences, they could be two, three, four sentences long just for your introduction sentences. And then each reason could be four, six, eight, ten sentences long. So remember that it doesn't have to be five sentences. In fact, by grade five, six, it should not be five sentences. It should be much more. The problem is students have trouble figuring out what else to add. And so when we show them, oh, you prove your reasons with facts, all of a sudden they have something else to add. Now, again, with essays. By the time you are in grade seven, eight, nine, an essay does not have to be five paragraphs long. You can have two introductory paragraphs. So we might have one introductory paragraph about um, the history of something and then another introductory paragraph about our thesis. Um, so we can have more than one introduction paragraph. We could have multiple reasons. We could have four reasons, five reasons, six reasons. The whole three reason thing is just a nice round number. There's no reason it has to be three. And then our conclusion can be one paragraph or two paragraphs, whatever makes sense for the topic. As they get into middle high school and higher and into post-secondary, we actually have like essays, inside essays, like nested. So if they have a really complex idea they're gonna to have to prove one point so that they can prove the next point. And that is like an essay in an essay. So then we have like multiple paragraphs, like lots and lots of ideas and reasons and proofs. So just remember that the most important thing is that your student just keeps working to the next step. As they continue to write, they will learn a skill and then we can move to the next step. Then, they get to write. This is the very first step that includes writing in the writing process. And I always laugh because the writing process is, has such an odd name. But the reason we call it the writing process is not because it's a lot of writing. It is the process by which we gain a piece of writing, the noun. And so it is the process that gives us writing, kind of like when we bake cookies, the baking is only like seven minutes long, but we all know that the ingredients and mixing and cleaning up, that all takes a lot longer. So the baking process is the process by which we come to get baking. So it's the same kind of idea. 
And in this step, this is so hard for students because even though they have that outline there and they just need to look at one paragraph at a time. So they, they need to actually, it's probably best to leave the introduction to the side because it's the hardest one to write. The introduction and conclusion are the hardest. And just pick one of the proof paragraphs, whatever one they are most comfortable with and just start to write it. Getting started and getting words on the page is very, very difficult. This, even for me, every time I write, I just say to myself, it doesn't matter. The first few sentences I write are all going to get wiped out and changed later anyway. It doesn't really matter. I just have to get started. So they need to get started with wherever they can start, however they can get started. And they have to overcome this idea that they need it to be perfect. It does not need to be perfect. It should not even be close to perfect. So this need for perfection in our writing, I think it comes from reading published material. So we believe that when we write, like actually sit down and write something or type it out, that it's gonna turn out the way all of that professional writing turns out. And that is so not the case. It is a process and it takes a different kind of mindset to take it one step at a time. So all you have to do is get it in the page. Don't worry about spelling, grammar, punctuation, anything, just make sentences. That's all that matters. You're making sentences from your notes and that's all. Then we edit. So then after it's all done, first of all, we revise actually. So we look at it and we say, okay, does this structure make sense? Is this in the best order it could be in? Maybe I should just move entire paragraphs around. Maybe I need some transitions in between paragraphs to help them flow better. Those kinds of changes. Do my facts actually prove the points that I'm trying to make? Do my reasons actually prove my thesis or do I need to tweak my thesis a little bit now that I've written this all out? So those kinds of things, those revisions, it's time for that first. Before we do the small changes, everyone wants to jump to spelling, grammar, punctuation. That's like the end. It's not, it doesn't come now. So first we need to make sure that the outside structure is all good. Because if we do all the small changes and then we make a whole bunch of revisions, we're just gonna have to redo things. And no one's got time to do things again. I don't. And your student is just going to be frustrated. So after we do large revisions, then we do smaller changes. We look at our sentences and we make sure that they make sense. We read them out loud, slowly, carefully. Do the sentences actually say what I think that they say? Uh, we change spelling, grammar, punctuation, all of those things. Reading for spelling, grammar, and punctuation is very, very difficult. This is a skill all in itself. It's a skill that we practice um, every week now in my level up writing class, just editing. Because even though you know rules over here, it's really hard to see it over here. It's different pieces of your brain. It's not that easy. And it just takes practice. The next thing we do is we get feedback. Um, it's not cheating to ask someone else to read our writing. Um, it is cheating if they get you to read your writing and you change all the spelling, grammar, and punctuation. If they hand something in to me and the spelling, grammar, and punctuation is like amazing, I'm going to level them up and I'm going to raise their standard. And guess what? Pretty soon, they're not even going to be able to do what I ask. It's so important that we don't step in and fix all of the problems. This is our time to just talk about the ideas, how well it's written, how logically it's written, where in this essay or paragraph are there logic gaps, what questions are you left with, what things do you not understand, those are the things we need feedback on. Getting someone else to edit their work is not going to help them in the long run because they're not going to learn how to do it. Sure, they'll get a great grade. Is that the purpose? Not really. 
Because when they go into a corporate world and they have to write uh, email or a report, there's no editor. They have to learn how to do these things. So let's not rescue our children from the process. Let's help them through the process to learn these things. After we get feedback, back to editing. Now we fix it again. Then we say, okay, well, they said they had questions about this and this didn't really prove it very well. I need to go and fix that. So those are the kinds of things that get changed after feedback. Edit again. Rinse and repeat again and again and again. Okay, we need to keep on editing. And this is where students wanna just hand it in. They don't want to edit it again. They're tired of it. They just want to tick the box and be done. The best writers are the ones who are the best editors. So some strategies here, change your location, print it off, change the font and the font size on your computer. It actually, your brain sees it differently because the words are in a different place on the page. Read it very slowly out loud period. Read the punctuation marks out loud. And every time you come to a period, every time you come to a comma, ask yourself, does there need to be a comma there? Why is there a comma there? Is this a complete sentence? Those are the questions that we need to like consciously be asking in order to be able to edit well. This is where we add MLA standard. So this is the spot that's going to really get stuck and the, the whole process is going to come to a grinding halt if your student, when they wrote, did not put their source codes beside their facts. And I forgot to mention that earlier, but when they write, they need to write it all out and they have it in their outline, fact, source code, fact, source code. And when they write their paragraph or their essay, they need to do their reason and their fact, and then in brackets, just put their source code. If they've done that, it's so easy to do MLA standard. And I will link this video on my YouTube with um, one about how to do MLA standard as well. Okay, so we can do in-text citations. That is the most um, common MLA standard that's used right now, which means no footnotes, no end notes. It is right in the writing. And we no longer call it a bibliography. So if you've never heard of a work cited, that is the list that goes at the end that in the old days we call a bibliography. It's not called a bibliography anymore, I'm pretty sure, because biblio means book. And for the most part, it's not books anymore. So the works cited are all types of works. They are documentaries, interviews, books online, websites, medical journals, whatever you have, they are all different works, all different types of writing. This is also where we check the rubric. Students should never, ever hand anything in without knowing what the expectations are. If they are in a course and the expectations have not been given them, they should ask, do you have a marking rubric for this? Because shame on the teacher if they don't. If the teacher does not have a marking rubric, they're marking it entirely subjectively. They're reading it and going, mm, that feels like a uh, 63. You know, that's the really bad way to grade because students get marked um, not equally and students have no way of knowing how to improve their writing because really that teacher doesn't know what's wrong with it. They're just like quickly reading it through and giving a, giving a grade. So check the marking rubric, look for the things. It's not cheating to look at the marking rubric and say, oh, I didn't do that and then go back and do it. That's what the marking rubric is for. Do your very best to actually hit all of the boxes on the marking rubric and believe that you're handing in a perfect paper. The real problem, the real, real problem with essay writing is not that you haven't taught these skills. The real problem is skills integration. So we learn over many, many years of education all of these different skills. And then we expect preteens and teens to just remember it all and pull it all together and figure it out. And it's really not that easy. It's really, really difficult. So skills integration is very difficult. 
And the other things are overwhelm and follow through. These, this is a lot of different things to do over a long period of time. And it's a process that they might not like or enjoy. And so following through and working on that again and again and again, and not just jumping to the final thing and handing in a submission and not being overwhelmed by the feeling that they're failing because they do a lot of work without getting feedback. Now, if they're in my classes, they get feedback every single step of the way. And at every step of the way, they hear how they can improve. And that is what students really, really need to succeed. So right now in the comments, I wanna know, right now, just pop in the comments and say, that's me, my kid needs feedback. If your student, if your student would really benefit from getting feedback every step of the way, go ahead and put that in the comments right now, because that is the one way we can help our students realize a growth mindset through the writing process and learn that it's not bad, that it's not perfect the first time around. It's just not finished yet. So we can't look at bread dough and expect fresh bread from the oven and be disappointed. We need to work through all the steps and to get there. All right. If you are interested and would like to know more about how I make this happen in my classes. How do I get these results? I teach full language arts and I also teach writing tutoring in classrooms for accountability. Every one of my classes comes with full support, full feedback, full grading, and your student never has to wonder if they're doing it right. They can reach out for help anytime. So if you wanna know how you can do that too, go ahead, go to discerntolearn.com. And if you just click right on the front, on the homepage, it'll be like for language arts classes or for tutoring classes, it'll take you to this page and you can get a free guide that shows you how I get the results I get. And if you just wanna follow me on social media, I would love it if you would check out uh, my group, facebook.com slash group slash language arts success or Instagram, discern underscore to underscore learn. Or I'm also on YouTube. Head on over there and check out all the reviews and all the amazing support that you'll find there. So I want to thank you so much for coming today and for joining me. And I really appreciate all of your feedback. So if you could just leave a comment, leave a question, and tell me what you also need to know, I would really appreciate it. I can't wait to hear from you. And I will talk to you very, very soon.